In 2011, a 28-hour killing spree unfolded in New York City. The amount of mayhem and murder that he left behind is truly amazing. Slashing his way through the streets. There was a whole pool of blood near that tree over there. Maxim Gelman was a man on a mission of murder. It was almost as he was a robot and he was programmed to kill. As the clock ticked, the body count rose. It seems to me he was going to kill anybody in his way. And with it, the question, what caused this small-time crook to commit his killing spree? He knew what he did was wrong, but he simply didn't care. The 12th of February, 2011, 9 a.m. The typical hustle and bustle of the city that never sleeps belied the fact that this was a day unlike any other. A killing spree was underway. There were hundreds of cops and detectives that were assigned to this. We were pulling people from all over the place. Anybody who was, uh, was working at that point in the detective bureau was assigned to this case. Detectives were frantically searching for Maxim Gelman, the man who over the last 28 hours had left four dead and three critically injured in a string of vicious stabbings, random carjackings, and indiscriminate assaults. He was being reckless. He was committing crimes in public. He was driving around at a high rate of speed. Concerns were mounting that the out-of-control killer would soon strike again. Not only are you trying to contain what's, what's happening, but you're trying to find this guy so that he doesn't hurt anybody else. So there is a lot of pressure that's put on the police department in a situation like this. He was, it seems, uh, becoming more and more unhinged and perhaps becoming more and more dangerous at the same time. The hunt for Maxim Gelman sprawled across the length and breadth of the city. New York City is a big place. You can hide just about anywhere. This is a dynamic situation that we're dealing with. We have enough resources in New York City to do this. We have the dogs and the helicopters and the license plate readers and the cars and the number of cops. But still, he's all over the place. And we don't know where he's going to pop up next. The indiscriminate nature of the crimes committed meant that even a chance encounter with New York's most wanted man could prove fatal. There was a sense of danger because people were realizing their life could be threatened. And it would not be because he hated them or because he had a grudge against them. It was because he was a guy who was out on the streets in public with knives and who was willing, apparently, to attack and maybe even kill anybody who got in his way. That same morning, Joe Lazito, a box office ticket seller from Philadelphia, was taking his daily commute into Manhattan, unaware of the drama that was unfolding. I got up super early. I had to make the commute, and everything that he had done the day before had not yet made it to the Philadelphia papers. So I was going into the city blind. I had no idea. While his day had begun like any other, Joe would make a seemingly innocent decision that would change his life. When I arrived at Penn Station that day, there was construction on the one train on the tracks. So when I got up to the platform, I had to make a decision. Do I stay on this platform or do I go to the other platform? For whatever reason this day, I decided, well, let me go to the other platform. It's double the trains. I'll get to work a lot quicker. A suspected sighting of the spree killer had investigators scouring the subway system. He was known to be in one set of tunnels connected to one subway line in one section of Manhattan. It was at this point that the cordon began tightening. 
the thing that really uh, sent up a red flag were two police officers got on the train and they went right into the motorman's compartment. So the police are actually driving with the conductors going southbound trains and northbound trains looking through the tunnels because this is where we believe he is. What I noticed is when they got on, their radios were blasting. They were on full blast. They were loud, they were active, and it was definitely different than the norm. Finally, the doors closed, and now we're moving at a snail's pace. So then I was really like, what's going on here? As the train finally pulled away from Penn Station, Joe was about to come face to face with Maxim Gelman, the most wanted man in New York City. This guy just walks right in front of me and starts banging on the door to the uh, motorman's compartment. And uh, he looked kind of dirty, um, disheveled, and he starts banging on the door, and he says, let me in. And I'm sitting here going, what is going on with this guy? And lo and behold, Max is on the train where the cops are riding with the conductors looking for him. Max turns around, and he focuses in on one of the passengers who happened to be probably the biggest guy on the train, this guy, Joe Lazito. So the next thing I know, he's about uh, two feet from me and about three feet from the door looks right down at me I look up at him we make eye contact he uh, takes out this big knife looks me dead in the eye and says you're gonna die In 2011, New York City would be struck by a killing spree. Carrying out a series of stabbings, carjackings and assaults, Maxim Gelman would stalk the streets for 28 hours. 1994, New York City. 17 years before the deadly spree, Six-year-old Maxim Gelman and his mother Svetlana immigrated to the United States from Ukraine, settling in the Sheep's Head Bay neighborhood at Brooklyn's southern tip. His father had left him early on in life. His mother remarried, lived uh, with his mom uh, and his stepfather. He had no brothers and sisters. He was an only child. His early years would entail a succession of setbacks and personal struggles to find acceptance in his new surroundings. Max, when he was young, he was a, an outsider. He definitely didn't have a lot of friends, maybe felt shy or wasn't confident enough in himself. I guess that's what kind of made him into a worse person. Gelman's childhood was filled with trouble. His uh, potential for killing was something that developed early and remained with him until he was in his early 20s. Life at home was also turbulent for the young Maxim. Max and his family, he wasn't so great with them. Max uh, expressed some uh, dislike in the way uh, his stepfather treated his mother. He you know, loved and respected his mother but his stepfather never respected him. He would always refer to his father as asshole in front of anyone, you know. I don't think that they ever had a normal relationship. It turned out to be a somewhat violent relationship. Gelman's battles with his stepfather were repeated, and the pair's obvious lack of affection for one another would prove an omen for the pointed altercation that was to come. The 11th of February, 2011, 5 a.m. The now 23-year-old Maxim Gelman was on the way to visit his mother. It was to be for the last time. Maxim Gelman went to his mother's house looking for his passport. 
Max thought he was being followed by the FBI and the DEA and the, he just called them the feds a lot of times. And he was worried that the police were onto him because he was an alleged drug dealer and he wanted to flee the country. He got there, uh, he knocked on the door, he got in. And this is where he runs into his uh, stepfather. Of course, at this point, Maxim appears to have been behaving in a pretty erratic fashion. That could have been enough to, to start tension with anybody. Believed to be under the influence of drugs, Gelman's curious behavior quickly began to arouse the suspicions of his parents. Max got into an argument with his mother and his stepfather regarding the car. He wanted the keys because his feeling, um, uh, and one might call delusions about the DEA out to get him. His behavior was really unusual. He was becoming more disturbing. The tensions rising inside the Gelman house were about to erupt. Something in Max's head at that point snapped, and, you know, he picked up the weapon of opportunity at that point, which was the knife. Unleashing a display of savage violence, Maxim's anger would boil over into murder. He stabbed his stepfather over 50 times. A knife is a much more personal weapon. Almost anybody can be trained to pull a trigger, but to actually plunge a knife into the body of a victim until he's dead indicates a, a tremendous amount of anger. The wounds were incredibly severe. He couldn't have survived that. There was very close range stab, and that sort of gave me the impression that Max was acting out of some sort of more than natural rage. The other thing, of course, it can tell us about Gelman is that Gelman was a very uh, spontaneous individual, and his rage was very quick to flourish and long-lasting. After his mother called 911, NYPD detective Joe Jackalone would begin to coordinate a response to Gelman's crime. At that point, it was just a domestic violence murder. That's, that's the way it was being handled. It was a, a fight between the stepfather and the stepson, and it ended in murder. And that we were looking for this guy, Maxim Gelman. We, we knew his name at this point, but we didn't understand the consequences of what else was happening. With the information available in these early stages, few could have foreseen the frenzy that was to come. With the blood of his stepfather on his hands and authorities heading his way, Gelman fled. So he figures he needs to get out of town at this point, so he takes everything and he leaves. Initially, from what we know, he was on his way out and then decided to come back in and figure now, now he wants to settle some scores. While detectives began their investigation at the Gelman house, Maxim would head back into the city and towards the home of 20-year-old Yelena Bulchenko. Wait, just make the camera lower so it's not like I'm like being recorded. Yelena was a very pretty girl. She was smart. Uh, she was funny. A uh, very sensitive, very sweet girl. And we already made plans for Valentine's Day. You know, I bought her a heart necklace. Uh, everything was set in place. Yelena and Gerard were no strangers to Maxim Gelman. Me, Yelena, and him had drove, driven to Long Island to visit someone, and things went well. I mean, there was nothing out of the ordinary. We were with each other, basically, for most of the morning. Gelman, however, seemed to believe that he and Yelena were more than just friends. He really liked her, and she didn't feel that way. His attitude towards relationships with women was one scarred by a sordid early encounter. He never really had a girlfriend, and I think what really tore him from reality is his first sexual experience. 
he had sex with a girl from the high school. And I think after that, he ended up getting a serious STD. How he told me was that he has lumps and that they weren't able to be even surgically removed. He kind of knew that he wouldn't be able to have a normal life anymore. Him and Yelena would really never be able to be a couple. He fixated on Yelena, an individual who showed him some kindness in passing, and that became so much more meaningful to him because he had nothing else in his life. Although his advances were rejected, Gelman would continue to pursue Yelena. Yelena changed her number because Max kept on you know, calling her over and over and over again uh, to the point where she was, you know, she was, she didn't want to have that, you know, she didn't want it to be bothered, you know, she was in a relationship with me, she didn't want to, you know, be stalked. I think Yelena's rejection really caused him to kind of become a stalker. He had showed up at her house one time, he was looking for her. He started banging on the door, going crazy. Um, saying, you know, I'll kill you if you don't open the door, and all these different types of things. She had really little interest in speaking with him, but his, the way he was reacting to her made some people say, in retrospect, that uh, there were warning signs that he could become very dangerous. The 11th of February, 2011, 10 a.m., five hours since the spree began. Sheepshead Bay, New York. Located merely a few blocks from the scene of his previous crime, Gelman would arrive at the Bulchenko residence. He drove to Yelena's mother's house and confronted her while she was on the phone. The person that was on the phone was able to overhear the conversation that was going on. And from what the, the caller stated was that you could tell it was an argument right off the bat. Max wanted to know where Yelena was. And Yelena's mom didn't want to give it up. Anna's refusal to divulge the details of her daughter's whereabouts meant she would face the sharp end of Maxim's violent temper. Max grabs the knife. You know, he's just puncturing, you know, the mother, like torturing her kind of thing, where he's trying to get information out of her where Yelena is. I think that Max probably knew that he was not going to get away with his crimes and that it would more satisfy him to do what he had to do. Uh, and, you know, in terms of the consequences, let him, you know, he didn't care. And eventually, I think Max just gets tired of the, of the game that he's playing with her, and, and he finally plunges the knife into her and kills her. The injuries were similar to the injuries to his stepfather, pretty much violent, multiple stab wounds. Anna is protecting her daughter at all costs, and she makes the ultimate sacrifice. Oblivious to the horrors unfolding at her home, Yelena would get wind of Gelman's earlier crimes. Yelena got a phone call letting her know that, you know, Max had killed his father in the morning. You know, this is around 3 o'clock, you know, 3.30, as Yelena's walking home. Max got back in his car and he was driving up and down the blocks and just looking for any sign of her. And during this time period, Yelena comes home. On her arrival, Yelena would be confronted by a scene of cruel violence. She discovered her mother's body and you know, freaked out as anybody would. It was a terribly horrendous bloody scene. And she is now outside of her house crying and she's calling on the, the cell phone, calling the police, calling anybody who will, uh, you know, come and help her. I get a phone call out of nowhere from Yelena's friend. And she tells me, oh, Yelena's mom has been stabbed. And I'm like, what? What are you talking about? What are you talking about? I, at first, I thought, you know, this was a prank, stupid prank call. I was like, you know, stop playing with me. You know, it's not cool. She's like, no, I'm serious. Yelena just got off the phone with me. So I was like, all right, I'm on my way. Yet unbeknownst to Gerard, he was not the only one heading in Elena's direction. At this time, 
Max arrives back at the house after failing to find her uh, at work or out in the street. To see him there, she probably put two and two together pretty quickly. So she runs to a neighbor. Gerard's concern for the safety of his girlfriend would quickly develop. We were just driving as fast and fast as possible, running red lights, doing whatever we needed to do to get there. I, uh, I kept on calling and calling. The more I kept on trying, the more nervous I became. Uh, and I started going crazy in the back seat of the car. You know, this can't be real. This can't be happening. I started crying, going crazy, yelling, screaming. Get there, get there. You gotta be there. We gotta get there. We gotta know what's going on. As an argument ensued outside the Bulchenko home, Gelman was determined to take revenge against Yelena for her rejection of him. Max basically overpowers a neighbor and just goes to kill her. And he stabs her and he walks away. He gets in the car and I guess he figures that, you know, what happens if she's still alive? So he gets back out of the car and, and basically in front of people he stabs her again. He really wanted her dead. Eleven hours into his spree, Maxim Gelman was now responsible for the death of a third innocent victim. My friends and I parked right near the police barricade, and I just jumped over the barricade. And, uh, you know, there was cops all in front of her house, and I ran over near her house, and then I guess the police didn't see me at first. So the police grabbed me and said, who are you, who are you? I was like, I'm, I'm her boyfriend, where, where is she? And she wasn't there, and there was a whole pool of blood on that, near that tree over there. And you could just see that this is something that, something that doesn't normally happen, uh, something outrageous, something crazy. On examining the evidence at their disposal, the reality of the danger they were facing began to dawn on detectives. After this incident, we're starting to, the police are starting to put two and two together, that there is a link between all of these murders. And if we don't stop this guy, he's going to kill more people. There's no question about it. The most dangerous person to deal with in the world is that person who has nothing to lose. The 11th of February, 2011, 4.30 p.m. A killing spree was underway in New York. The normally quiet neighborhood of Sheep's Head Bay was at its epicenter. Having murdered his stepfather at 5 a.m. that morning, Maxim Gelman had now claimed the lives of three in little over 11 hours. As investigators descended on the scene of his latest double crime, the slayings of mother and daughter Anna and Yelena Bulchenko, an increasingly out of control Gelman would attempt to evade their attentions. Max fled in a hurry uh, after killing Yelena. Max just was enraged and uh, determined to kill. In making his getaway, Gelman would again demonstrate his apparent disregard for anyone who might stand in his way. As he's fleeing, he runs over Stephen Tannenbaum, who was uh, an older gentleman. He was actually a coin collector and dealer, and he was in the crosswalk, and, and Max just ran him down. And he, was, he was pretty much dead at the scene. He just kept on driving, didn't stop, didn't flinch, he just kept on going. Now that detectives understood they were dealing with a spree of connected killings, their efforts to apprehend the culprit would intensify. However, finding one man amongst a city of millions posed police with a significant problem. You have to learn how to play chess as the police, where you have to think sometimes two or three moves 
ahead of the bad guy. One of the first steps when you're what we call hunting for a known perpetrator is you try to find out where they've been in the past, where they've lived, who their friends are, uh, if he's ever been arrested anywhere else, because these are the places that you'd likely show up again. Leaving no stone unturned, detectives would enlist known associates of Gelman to assist with the search. We got a you know, strong knock on our door, and I opened it, and there were probably around eight detectives asking me about Max, and they said, you know, Max murdered someone, but they asked me to maybe help them to look for him. I was uh, basically driving with the police, and it was really insane. I couldn't believe the amount of police that there were outside. Gelman, however, was able to stay one step ahead of his pursuers, turning his knowledge of the city's abandoned train tracks to his advantage. The train tracks that Maxim Gelman apparently used as a getaway route uh, are in a really desolate area. They run along a, a sunken bed that cuts through neighborhoods. His understanding of this underground network had developed during his years as a graffiti writer. When we would write together, uh, we only wrote like in, uh, in places where it was kind of abandoned, where nobody would be around us. Maxim would use his artistic outlet to express his attitudes on the way he viewed the world. He would write things like, uh, nothing to lose, you know, just these like hopeless kind of quotes. I, I guess he was looking for help, but he didn't know how to find it. His reputation as an eccentric would also develop amongst those that moved in the same circles. He would make, uh, you know, voices. If a gangster or what you see on TV, you know, a mobster, when he would start an altercation with somebody, he would talk to them in this voice. And people just thought, like, what's wrong with this guy? He was just, uh, you know, I guess a sick person. Gelman's affectations towards the gangster lifestyle would eventually be reflected in his reality. From what I know, he was selling, you know, cocaine. He was selling heroin. You know, he was selling pills and all types of different things. He was involved in terms of his drug uh, use with Angel Dust or PCP. It's a drug that's not common among drug users because of the ill effects that it has. It takes over a person's whole mind. It can lead to aggressive, um, violent behavior. Years before the spree began, friends would come face to face with Maxim's violent unpredictability. I'm just walking down the street and uh, Max sees me in his car and he pulls over and he jumps out with a knife. And he definitely wanted to, you know, cause harm to me. And he was, you know, basically jabbing a knife at me. Max was very unpredictable and he was very dangerous. You know, this was somebody who you can't imagine is actually out on the streets. The 12th of February, 2011, 1 a.m. Crown Heights, Brooklyn. Five miles away and eight hours on from his last confirmed sighting, Maxim Gelman would begin the second stage of his ever escalating spree. Maxim Gelman had not been seen for several hours, but around 1 a.m. he showed up in Crown Heights, uh, some distance away from Midwood, where the police were looking for him. Max shows back up on, on the grid and he decides that he needs another car, he needs to still get away. So he comes across uh, a livery cab that's parked on the side of the road. For the driver of the cab, Fitz Fullerton, it would be a fare he would never forget. Maxim got into the back seat, then as they were driving along, he attempted to commandeer the cab. He tried to take it over and the taxi crashed and Maxim fled. He had stabbed the, the, the driver and he had left. So. You know, fortunately, he survives. Now Max is still on the hunt for another car. Now he probably realizes once this gets notified to the police that the police are going to have a beat on him where he's showing up next. 
Gelman, however, was not to be deterred in his quest to commandeer a car. A matter of minutes later, and little more than a mile away from the Fitz Fullerton scene, he would strike again. He comes across Sheldon Pottinger, who was outside of the church waiting for his family to come out. He jumps into the car, and he takes off in the car. He stabs Sheldon, and he tells him, as he's driving 60, 70 miles an hour, he tells him to get out. And can you imagine being in this position where you've just been stabbed, you're carjacked, and now you're driving 60, 70, 80 miles an hour, wherever it may be, and he tells you, your best bet is to jump out of a car to survive. Well, Sheldon jumps out of the car. He miraculously survives. This guy was driving fast. And I pushed myself out of the car, hold the knife, and I hoping to do, I push myself out. And I fell on the floor. I get up and I start running. I run back down to the church. Gelman would, however, leave behind a clue that would prove crucial in his undoing. He abandoned the Nissan near a subway station in Queens, and what he did for the next few hours is unclear. When we found out about Sheldon Pottinger's car, that, that license plate immediately transmitted to every police officer in the city that's working. And a couple of patrol cops in Queens stumble, stumble upon the car near the subway station. So uh, the police start to put two and two together that he probably hopped on a train. With detectives now alerted to Gelman's most recent movements, the elusive killer would once again go to ground. He was next seen hours later, around 8.30 a.m., uh, in the subway system in Manhattan. As the spree entered its 28th hour, news of Gelman's exploits had made the front page. Max is on the downtown train, and as he's walking through the cars, he sees his face on the front of one of the newspapers. And he, he pretty much you know, knocks the paper out of the woman's hand. She became very frightened and upset. She got off the subway. Uh, she found police officers on the subway platform and told them that she was pretty sure she had just encountered Maxim Gelman. The irrationality of Gelman clearly shows that he wasn't acting on thought or cognition. Gelman, of course, is a spontaneous reactor. He's not a planner, he's not a thinker. He's just enjoying the high and living it while he can. With reports regarding Gelman's whereabouts reaching police, the focus of the citywide search would narrow, centering in on the network of tunnels running beneath the streets. There are very few ways to get out of the subway system. In order for him to get out of that subway system now, it would take like an actor Houdini to get out. Gelman, it seemed, had backed himself into a corner. The police set up a checkpoint at Penn Station. Uh, Max's train was coming their way. Yet even with the odds of escape stacked against him, Gelman would make another move that kept him a step ahead of the pursuing police. He got off the train and left not via the platform, but jumped onto the subway tracks, crossed several tracks, and then pulled himself into a train going the opposite direction. And he is actually heading towards the busiest transit hub probably in the world, Times Square. With nowhere left to run, Maxim Gelman would make one last desperate play, and in doing so, thrust unsuspecting commuter Joe Lazito to the center of the story. Max decides that he's going to, to hijack the train. So he's banging on the door of the conductor. He was banging on the door. He was announcing that he was an official visitor. And at this point, Max turns around and he grabs a hold of Joe Lazito. I looked in his eyes, he looked in my eyes. There was nothing there. It was the whole lights are on, but nobody's home. I mean, it was almost as he was a robot and he was programmed to kill. The part where he takes the knife out really happened in slow motion. The initial stab almost seemed matter-of-factly. He took out the knife, it was huge, and it was filthy. And he plunges the knife right into my face right here. I said, okay, we're in a fight now. There's no thought process. It's like you're in a savage mode. It's just survival. 
I kind of propelled myself from the seat. Now he has free reign of the back of my head. And uh, obviously at that point, I can't see what he looks like. When he was stabbing me, when he was slicing me, it was just a sense of urgency trying to get the knife away from him. The first time he swung up at me, I tried to catch his wrist and I missed and he sliced me in the thumb. The second time he sliced up at me, I missed again and he sliced my tricep. Finally, the third time he sliced his arm up, I caught it with my hand, I slammed his hand down and the knife came out. That's how I disarmed him. After 28 hours, Gelman's cruel killing spree had been brought to an end by the bravery of just one man. After I disarmed him, that's when the police came out of the motorman's compartment and tapped me on the shoulder and said, you can get up, we got him. Yet despite Joe's heroics, the injuries he had sustained were severe. While this was going on, I am sitting on the subway seat I just looked at Gelman and I said, you better hope I die, because if I don't, I'm going to come back and kill you. In February 2011, New York City was subject to a 28-hour killing spree. Beginning in Brooklyn, Maxim Gelman would take the lives of four and injure four more in a series of stabbings, carjackings, and assaults. The spree would finally come to a close in the center of the Manhattan subway system, after passenger Joe Lozito disarmed New York's most wanted man in hand-to-hand -hand combat. About nine o'clock in the morning, the, this, this finally came to a conclusion when the officer was able to handcuff him and get an ambulance, get some help for uh, the passenger. That, that had been stabbed. I mean, this, this poor guy was very fortunate to be alive. In the aftermath of the altercation, Joe was now left fighting for survival. While I was sitting there and uh, watching my life pour out of me, I'm screaming, we have to get this train moving. I'm going to die. I can't die on this train. When they lifted me from the seat, I passed out. And when they put me down, I snapped out of it, and I was up again. And that, that moment, that was the first time I had felt any pain. It was the worst pain I'd ever felt. Joe would soon begin to learn just how lucky he was to be alive. And I heard one of the officers call me likely, and I didn't know what that meant. And later on at the hospital, uh, my sister, who is also a New York City police officer, she goes, Joseph, do you know what that means? I said, no, no. She goes, that means likely to die. Befitting the events of this unimaginable story, its end would come in one of New York's most iconic locations. Ironically, this all occurs above 42nd Street in Times Square, the crossroads of the world. He's walked out of the subway into the back of a police car in front of thousands of people watching what's going on. But when the word goes out that he was, he was finally under police control, I mean, everybody, it was just a sigh of relief. I remember sitting in the office and going, you know, you know, whew, I thank God that's over. Without the actions of Joe Lozito that morning, the number of victims claimed by Gelman could have been far higher. I've been called a hero, and, and I'm so appreciative for it, but that's not me. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not a hero. I, I just I did what had to be done that day. In court, Gelman would show little contrition. Instead, he would glory in the notoriety he had gained. I would call his sentence a performance rather than a sentence. His actions in, in Brooklyn court that day were like every other thing he's ever done. They're deplorable. He kept on looking over to me, smiling, you know, saying stupid things under his breath towards me, looking at me. 
I had to take measures to stop him from talking, and, um, but he always wanted to get it out. I, I don't know if he was trying to create that gangster persona because he knew that he was going to spend the rest of his life in jail. However, despite his despicable behavior, the victims of his crimes would be given a chance to have the last word. I tried my best, you know, to, to keep my cool, but he kept on looking at me. And he kept on giving me a smirk and laughing or smiling. And that's what got me. I mean, in my mind, I was thinking, you know, can I, can I kill him in the courtroom? So this is like looking in the face of evil. And I told him, I was like, you're gonna, you're gonna burn in hell. I played out the scenario in my head about a thousand times. I visualized what I wanted to say to him. It was a little nerve wracking, to be honest, but I looked at Max and I told him I had waited over a year to look into those eyes again. I told him that, uh, you know, I hope he enjoyed life in prison and that he had hell to look forward to. Maxim Gelman would plead guilty to each of his 13 charges including the murders of his stepfather, Alexander Kuznetsov, Anna and Yelena Bolchenko, and Stephen Tannenbaum. He would be sentenced to a total of 225 years behind bars. With the facts of this entirely unprecedented case established, a crucial question still burned brightly. What could have caused Maxim Gelman to conduct his killing spree? Was his plan that day to do all these things, or was it just he snapped and, uh, and went off on the deep end because of the father in the morning? You know, we'll never know. At best, he had some form of paranoid element to his personality, where his ways of interpreting the world and understanding what the world means is seriously disordered. The only motivation I could think that Max would try to do this is, be, you know, he had a long history of drug use. Maybe the drugs, you know, affected his brain in, in, in a certain way and just made him snap. While there was never a determination that Max was legally insane, he was certainly exhibit, exhibiting evidence of psychosis and, and sociopathic and psychopathic behavior. So the, that's the place they're in. Um, they're in a different place than a normal human being. Upbringing probably has a lot to do with it. But there are productive members of society who had terrible upbringings, and they were able to overcome it. You know, we know that he was not suffering from some severe mental illness. He knew what he did was wrong, but he simply didn't care. He chose to do it, and he was able to kill with moral impunity. I think Gelman could represent a new different type of spree killer that, that we haven't really seen much of before. He's an incidental spree killer. He's trying to escape, he's desperate to get away, and he will kill people if he has to. There is little doubt that the lives of those who lost loved ones will never be the same again. Elena was a beautiful girl, smart, had an enormous future in front of her that was taken, you know? Her brother lost a sister. Her brother lost a mother. Her father lost everybody. He's in the house alone now. Um, and I just hope that Maxim is suffering. I sit here before you today knowing how lucky I am because I have no business being here. I should be dead. I should have been his fifth victim. For Gerard, of all the difficult questions posed by the events of that day, the hardest one to ask is what if. I drive around this neighborhood a lot and I never come up the block. Um, it just brings me back to that day. It feels like it was yesterday, you know? You keep on thinking in your head, if I was here or if I, was, I didn't go to work that day, or if I uh, was here 20 minutes, 30 minutes earlier, could I have stopped them? Get the hell out of here. It's a little bit much. 